Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I am the science coordinator for the partnership. And we're very pleased um, to have Jack Schmidt with us today. Jack is going to be, um, Jack is the professor of watershed sciences at Utah State University and is also the chief of the U.S. Geological Survey Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Today he's going to be presenting um, on a geomorphic perspective on restoring the Rio Grande and the Colorado River in the United States and Mexico. This is a topic that's of great interest to the Desert LCC. We have uh, one of our primary uh, topics that we focus on is management of water resources and conservation of stream and river ecosystems. And so Jack's presentation um, is highly relevant to, to, to that interest and to the work of several of our teams in the partnership. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jack, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, can you hear me? Is this the right volume? Sounds good. Okay, I, uh, if I start talking too loud, Amy, you, you and I know each other, you can butt in and say, Jack, tone it down a little. All right, um, thanks to everyone. Um, I just want to, let me just take a second in case there's any confusion here. Um, I have been on the faculty at Utah State University for uh, more than 20 years. And a little over three years ago, I took leave of absence from Utah State to come down to Flagstaff to uh, serve as chief of the Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center, which uh, has, is a wonderful experience. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the work of the, of the um, GCMRC, but I'm also going to talk about work that's gone on in my lab. Um, in early November, I'm going to be leaving my position as chief of GCMRC and return full-time to the Utah State faculty. Um, my focus today is uh, to talk about um, the rivers that cross the Colorado Plateau and the basin and range. These two great rivers that we share between the United States and Mexico whose primary runoff comes from the middle and southern Rocky Mountains uh, in the states of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah, and then course southward to the Sea of Cortez and the Gulf of Mexico. I've uh, depicted here crudely the width of the, the significance of the flow in different parts of the Colorado and Rio Grande to emphasize the fact that a significant amount of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo's water comes from the Rio Conchos, and I'll talk about that uh, um, in the last third of my talk. Um, we, many of us, have a long-standing interest in environmental flows. And we understand that the aquatic organisms and the native riparian habitats um, are strongly determined by the stream flow, by the amount and timing of the flood regime and the characteristics of the base flow. And we also know that the stream flow uh, structures the um, river channel and its habitats. But I also, in this talk, want to emphasize the fact that stream flow transports sediment. Um, and in so doing, uh, it also strongly restructures the characteristics of the channel's habitat and the geomorphology of the floodplain. And in turn, those changes in the habitat associated with sediment transport and sediment deposition and erosion structure the world in which aquatic and riparian organisms uh, live and flourish or are threatened. 
Uh, I understand fully that the characteristics of the aquatic and riparian ecosystem also have to do with issues that have nothing to do with hydrology and geomorphology, uh, things like non-native invasions, uh, water temperature, water quality. But my focus today is on sediment transport and geomorphology. Um, this is sort of a representative, um, this might be a representative uh, environmental flow uh, recommendation that includes the typical components of um, in-stream flow recommendations, having overblank flows, having high flow pulses, defining what should be the base flows, uh, defining what should be the dead minimum flows. And um, this has been a standard focus of the, in, of the environmental flows literature. Um, defining these flows and often defining these flows based on historical uh, evaluation of um, the statistics of stream flow hydrology. But what I want to emphasize is that these traditional approaches to defining environmental flows ignore the fact that flows transport sediment. And in so doing, we have to worry not only about the direct relationship between flow and organisms, but also ask ourselves what happens to sediment transport as we define flows. Um, this plot here on the left shows the width of the different stream segments, the Mississippi, the Colorado, the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, uh, and how much sediment they transported uh, at the time of first European settlement uh, uh, in the United States about 1700. And you can see that the Colorado delivered more sediment to the sea than any other river system except the Missouri Mississippi system. The Rio Grande was the third largest uh, deliverer of sediment. And these are the estimated sediment loads. And the important point is that the sediment loads of the Colorado primarily uh, came into the system in the Colorado Plateau and the basin and range uh, parts of the system, not in the distant Rocky Mountains. And the same is true for the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. Environmental flows are often proposed for rivers um, that are affected by dams and diversions. And so the notion that one defines flows in rivers that are in equilibrium is often misguided. In fact, most of the rivers that we are concerned about have already been perturbed into a condition of sediment deficit or sediment surplus, illustrated here by the erosion of sandbars in Grand Canyon, illustrated here by the narrowing and infilling of the channel on the San Rafael River in central Utah. And so, again, I'm just trying to emphasize that you can't forget about sediment when you worry about environmental flows. Large dams typically trap all of the incoming sediment supply. And so, in this sense, in this simple graph, if we deplete the natural flow regime, uh, I'm sorry, if we deplete the natural sediment surplus regime, Depending on the balance between how much we deplete the sediment supply and the water supply, we have a potential immediately below dams to trip systems into sediment deficit. In contrast, if we take all the water out of a river system but we don't change the sediment supply, we can have a condition where there's too much sediment available uh, for the available um, a water supply and we can trip a system into sediment surplus. This uh, has been, uh, these conditions of deficit and surplus have been measured even below the large dams. Uh, this is a, a plot of the longitudinal profile of the lower Colorado River 
between Hoover Dam and the U.S.-Mexican border. And in red, I've colored those long reaches of the river where the Bureau of Reclamation measured sediment evacuation in the years after completion of Hoover Dam and Parker Dam in the 1930s and 1940s. In this graph, uh, where zero is the location of Hoover Dam, and these data are before the construction of Davis Dam, you can see the cumulative volume of evacuated sediment and how, with time, the river continued to evacuate sediment, and the distance over which evacuation proceeded extended until about 150, until evacuation had occurred as far as 140 kilometers downstream from Hoover Dam. But further downstream, all of that sediment accumulated in the river was in a condition of sediment surplus. It had too much sediment for the available water. And so the problem down here was too much sediment. The problem up here was too little sediment. And a similar pattern existed down uh, at least 200 kilometers downstream from Parker Dam. So the point is, near the dams, the problem is too little sediment. Further downstream, the problem is often too much sediment. And the same was measured below Elephant Butte Dam after Elephant Butte Dam was completed in 1913. Uh, the river evacuated sediment between Elephant Butte and El Paso, and then in the El Paso Juarez Valley, the river accumulated sediment. Uh, immediately down, uh, but it also matters what, whether the bed uh, um, can uh, be, for conditions of deficit, it matters whether the bed is erodible or not. In the 15 miles immediately below Glen Canyon Dam, the bed of the river in size three to five meters, such that the river evacuated its sand bed, eroded down into gravel until the remaining gravels were too coarse to move. The river eroded and lowered itself and disconnected itself from its pre-dam floodplain. In the Grand Canyon, further downstream, the river is also in deficit, but the river cannot erode its bed through the bouldery rapids that occur in Grand Canyon. And so the river is never able to lower its slope and have a reduced mechanical energy and so the river is sort of condemned to always be steep. That's what makes it a fun river to, to, to uh, float and negotiate its rapids. But it will always have too much energy for this available sand supply. And so the beaches of Grand Canyon have often been severely eroded. So what I'm trying to say is, in a condition where the river has too much, essentially too much water for its available sediment supply, sometimes the river erodes its bed and reduces its slope. But in other places, it can't do that because the river is too bouldery. And then the condition of deficit will exist in perpetuity. The alternative uh, condition, which is a river that has too much sediment for its available water supply, is illustrated in this slide showing river channel shrinking and aggradation on the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, just uh, upstream from the Rio Conchos near Presidio, Texas. <coughs> In a river system like the Colorado River, where we have dams in different parts of the watershed, where these dams control the water supply, 
but where sediment continues to come in further downstream, we have a general pattern where we have deficit conditions below each dam, but then we have surplus conditions in a few places further downstream. We have both, and the point is that the physical problems and the physical changes of the rivers are different in different places. You can't just assume the same kind of uh, degree of change uh, below every dam. We have costly programs to rehabilitate the fisheries and the aquatic and riparian habitats in different parts of the river system, and yet the problems are different from place to place. Um, I just want to talk for a second. The Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program is a program that exists to make recommendations on how to manage the Colorado River below Glen Canyon Dam. There are a wide range of stakeholders represent different, different interests, the tribes themselves and the seven basin states. And the responsibility of the Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center is to provide the science support to this adaptive management program. Um, the big questions in the adaptive management program relate to um, what to do about a fine sediment resource most of which is now trapped in Lake Powell. How can we uh, have the most advantageous resources in um, uh, Grand Canyon despite the fact that the river has been perturbed into sediment deficit? Um, there are also significant questions related to maintenance of a high quality rainbow trout fishery in Glen Canyon and recovery of the endangered and humpback chub, especially in a situation where trout eat chub. Um, but those biological interactions are, are uh, the focus of another talk, uh, not my remarks today. Eddie sandbars, the ones that remain, are an important component of the pre-dam river landscape, are used by camping parties, and have resource significance. And ironically, the depletion and reduction in size of river deposited eddy sandbars also has an implication even upslope on the walls of the canyon because this sand is blown up to these areas where they bury and protect archaeological sites. And so there's even a transfer of this problem of too little sediment even high up on the canyon walls. Uh, the cost of simply adding sediment into Grand Canyon are too large at this point for the federal government to consider this solution and there would be stakeholder opposition um, related to some of the biological resources. And so that even though we sort of know what this solution would cost, this is not the solution that we pursue right now. And so the management decision is to make the most with the available supply of sediment that we have uh, by releasing occasional controlled floods whenever fine sediment has recently been delivered from tributaries. The conceptual model that drives this is that we have a river that occasionally receives sediment from tributaries, and that fine sediment can be relatively quickly, in a matter of weeks to months, transported downstream to Lake Mead, and this transport would occur on the bed of the river and essentially we would never know it occurred. And so that would not provide any resource good. And so instead what we try to do is schedule controlled floods which would mobilize this sand on the bed and then redistribute some of that sand entrained in the flow 
into these channel margin deposits and we try to at least rebuild these deposits, these pockets of sand along the margins of the river. And uh, as I say, if we don't do that, then this sand only sort of goes downstream to Lake Mead in a couple months and doesn't do much good. The primary source of sediment to the river is the Perea River watershed, which enters the Colorado River 15 miles downstream from Glen Canyon Dam. Um, this is a downstream view of the Colorado River, and the Perea River is coming out right here, and you can see adding some turbidity to the river, such that here the river is, is turbid, this is the main supply, um, and it's this sand that we're trying to mobilize that comes in from the Perea to build beaches further downstream. We know that there is great annual variability from year to year. There are some years when the Perea River does not significantly flood. There's no real supply, and other years where we have major floods. And we also know that the primary season when floods occur is during the summer-fall season of the North American monsoon. When, he, when tributary floods occur in a few days, occasionally there are winter storms which might develop floods. Um, and so a high flow experiment protocol was adopted by the Department of the Interior in spring in 2012 and implemented in the summer and fall beginning in 2012 in which we essentially define a season of accumulation when we track the inputs of potential sediment uh, coming in from the Perea River and then we have a season when, if there's enough sediment coming in, we could schedule a flood. And then we start counting again if there's a season, if the winter rains uh, bring in sediment, we might have a spring flood. And so the environmental compliance was instituted to run a 10-year experiment in which we would track we would measure and account for the inflows and then potentially schedule floods. And so ironically, in a river system that has too little sediment, where 95% of the sediment that once flowed through Grand Canyon is now trapped in Lake Powell, we have one of the most sophisticated sediment monitoring programs that I know of in the world. The width of these bars is proportional to the sediment flux through Grand Canyon before and after the dam, and um, representing the fact that the Perea River is really the main, um, the only significant supplier of sediment to the first 60 miles of the river here. And we now have gauges shown in red on the main stem of the Colorado River all the way through the system, in green on small tributaries, in purple are uh, temperature, measurement, uh, temperature measurements made on the main stem of the Colorado River. And so the USGS chases floods on the Colorado River, uh, on the Perea River all summer and fall, makes measurements using pump samplers, makes measurements using direct uh, uh, measurements from, um, from fixed reels on the bridge at the mouth of the uh, Perea River. And then um, we... Um, uh, so this is a measurement just for this monsoon season beginning on July 1 of 2013. These are the flows. Uh, three floods have occurred. We use a model to estimate the sand load. Um, and so these are model estimates. And this is the, est this is the cumulative sand load 
little over 600,000 metric tons we estimate to have come in. Um, these, are in these are very quick estimates, and at the same time, all those samples that I illustrated um, being collected go to a lab. The lab processes those, and then we continually recalibrate our estimates of the sand load based on the lab working around the clock um, uh, to, to, to um, determine the concentrations that have been transported by the flow. We have, um, we have sensors on small ephemeral streams um, that we only visit once every six months, but we constantly try to estimate what is the long-term average sediment supply from these little tiny ephemeral tributaries on the Navajo Reservation on BLM land, and then we calibrate and make estimates of what, if we take real-time measurements on the Perea River that we can drive to, we also sort of say, well, how much is likely to have come in from all these other little tributaries that we we'll measure every once in a while? In the bottom of the Grand Canyon, we have continuous sensors, acoustic systems that continually measure the attenuation of sound coming out from sensors um, um, that are a very modern way to measure continuously sediment uh, transport, suspended sediment load. And we calibrate these data with pump samplers that are timed to collect physical samples along the banks of the river. You can see that we disguise and hide these sampling systems uh, because it is in Grand Canyon National Park. And we also calibrate um, these um, pump samplers and the acoustic samplers with physical samples. In some cases, um, uh, we use sport boats every uh, three to four months to collect cross-sectionally average samples. And then um, from the cableways that exist um, at Lee's Ferry and here at the uh, near Phantom Ranch just above Bright Angel Creek, um, here is um, the traditional old sampling uh, gauge that's existed since the 1920s. Here's a cableway with a sampler and then lower that sampler down to the river, collect a depth integrated sample, do this all the way across the river. The boat helps support that and then there's a bottle sampler inside. We physically collect the samples. Why do we need to collect samples continuously using those acoustic samples? Well, it turns out that there isn't a constant relationship between the discharge of water and how much sediment is moved by these rivers. We first detected that in 1996, when during the seven days of the 1996 controlled flood, the concentration of sediment measured for sand or silt at different places along the river steadily decreased during the seven days of the flood. What we learned in 1996 was that the flood ran out of sediment. That's when we realized that controlled floods could only be a few days long because otherwise we would essentially ream out the system. And so then we learned that we had to delicately balance the duration and, and magnitude of floods with how much sediment there was to move. And we have learned then by taking that signal and looking at other rivers in different places that in fact there's a strong nonlinearity, a strong hysteresis to the relationship between water discharge and how much sediment is transported that we've seen in the timing of the long historical record of the Green River at Jensen on the San Juan River. Um, where, where depending on when the sediment supply shows up, sometimes the falling limb can increase the sediment, can have more sediment transported than the, the falling limb. Um, 
the basic message here is that a lot of sediment transport work has been has gone on just drawing some sort of a best fit line through a data set of enormous scatter. And we realize that we can't do that. We have to actually measure the transport in time, and then we need to track whether what these patterns are and then actually develop continuous estimates of sediment transport. It's not good enough to show up every once in a while, stick a bottle in, and then just draw a line through a wide scatter of data. Um, at the 30-mile site in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, these are the flows, the hydropower flows, during the two months of the monsoon season here at at uh, the same data, uh, the duration, the period of time that I showed you for the Perea, where we've had a few discrete floods, and otherwise the river has been dry. Here, you can see the river goes up and down every day, and this is the concentration of sediment, and really not much happening, the river being pretty damn clear, and then even though the flows didn't change or in fact went down, the concentration of sediment went up. Why? Because the Perea River flooded. And some of the sand that came down the Perea River was instantly flushed right on through. This is the cumulative sand load. So we're tracking not only what comes into the river, but also what is moved through. We only download these data once a month, which is why these data only go to September 2nd. So the last piece of the puzzle is that a mass we calculate mass balances for segments of the river. What goes in minus what goes out is what's left behind. And we serve these data all on a website so that anybody can calculate these mass balances. Because, of course, it's not good enough for us as scientists to come up with these methods. We have to serve these data to all those stakeholders I showed you and to the engineers at the Bureau of Reclamation so that decision, operational decisions can be made about how to schedule the next controlled flood. And so for the data that we have to date, for right now, real time, uh, what's happening in Grand Canyon, we know how much sediment has come in from the Perea River. We know that most of this sand has, is now sitting on the bed in the first 30 miles of the river. We know that there's been a small amount that has come through and is sitting on the bed of the river in the lower 30 miles of Marble Canyon, and we know that only the tiniest amount has come through, and in fact, the flows released from Glen Canyon have actually, to a very small degree, eroded the sand out of this section down here. So we also understand the spatial characteristics of where the sand sits. And the last piece of this is the piece that says, so what kind of a flood can we have? Well, depending on how much sand we have come in, we've also developed a, hydro, a sediment transport model that we use to estimate how much sand would be transported by floods of different um, uh, durations and of different magnitudes and we run these models. These models were also developed by G USGS uh, scientists. The Bureau of Reclamation runs these models. And we'll go in real time right to the, mid to the middle of October. And then we'll sort of know what magnitude of flood to schedule. So I just wanted to illustrate for you what goes on behind the scenes to implement this high flow protocol. We serve these data at uh, the USGS website um, here. And I just want to show you this for a minute. 
We're actually doing uh, fine on time. I think I'll get this done at 1.50. If you um, uh, go to uh, www.gcmrc.gov, then um, you'll come to our website. And if you scroll down to Discharge Sediment and Water Quality Monitoring, you'll see the various places in the West where we run this program. If you go to Grand Canyon to monitoring sites, you'll go to all of the gauges that we run. And for instance, here is the Perea River at Lee's Ferry, um, Arizona. And you can select any attribute, water temperature, discharge. You can identify a period of time. This is the period of time the records are available. And then you can click Build Graph. And here is a graph. And here is um, the relevant information. And uh, for some reason, look at that. How do you like that? We don't have temperature data. Uh, for that period of time, but if we went, for instance, to the instantaneous sand load. Jack, could you make uh, it just a little bigger in the screen? I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Um, Much better. Here is the uh, instantaneous sand load. So if we went back and we went back again um, and we went to the Colorado River at um, um, near 30 mile, you could see that we're not only serving um, sediment data, but also water temperature, specific conductance, dissolved oxygen, you name the time frame. So uh, I just want to encourage you, and I'm going to go and now in a bit, I'm going to talk about our program in Big Bend, where the pro program is very different, and we only show we only run a very few set of gauges. Um, I'd like to point out that in Dinosaur, in the upper green, we have a number of gauges. So, um, with that, I just want to GCMRC. Dot gov, uh, your one-stop shop for sediment transport and ecological information on rivers. Okay, um, I think I would be remiss if we didn't. I didn't spend a minute or two saying how is this protocol working. We have uh, uh, remote cameras that take pictures every day of a number of sandbars. There's also a link on that GCMRC homepage um, where all these photos are also available. Obviously, at GCMRC, our job is to be completely transparent with our science. We have to serve data to stakeholders so that real-time decisions can be made. And we have to serve data on the results of our work so that people who participate in the public policy process also can form, the, can form their own opinions on how we're doing and whether it's worth it or not. Um, here are some great gains caused at Carbon Creek by these high flows. But this also implicitly shows you that the intervening operations erode this bar back to this in the time between the floods. So we learn about the good cause of floods, but we also learn that we can't essentially bank these gains uh, in perpetuity. We also know that these floods don't cause increases and gains in every sandbar. We know that the gains are only occurring in about 50% of the places we survey. And so we're trying to understand the spatial patterns of the gains but uh, to talk about this anymore is beyond the uh, limits of time here. That's another talk. And so here's what we've sort of learned about it, how we're, 
if we're going to improve sandbars in Grand Canyon. These are four hypothetical graphs in which time is represented on the horizontal axis and the potential gains in sandbar size are represented under four potential scenarios. This would be a scenario in which the gains caused by floods are then eroded away during the time between the floods such that over the long period of time there would be no net increase although there would be periods of time when the bars would be bigger. This is, a, this is another hypothetical condition in which we improve the average size of sandbars by not eroding all that was gained through widely spaced floods, in this case by short duration periods of time. This would be an undesirable condition. And what we've learned then is that if we're going to improve sandbars in Grand Canyon, partly it's the science of how we get the most gain, the, big, the biggest bang for the buck of uh, building sandbars when we can do them. And I think this is the piece of the science that we understand the best. We struggle to understand how to control the erosion that occurs between the floods. And this, to some extent, is the business of the Long-Term Experimental and Management Plan, EIS, in which uh, the operations between the floods are being evaluated. And, and the spacing of when we can have the floods is largely determined by nature it's, and climate change which is how frequently will we get inputs of sediment from the Puria River and other tributaries. All right, the last piece of this talk is about a very different kind of problem, but where sediment man matters. And that's on the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo in the Big Bend, where the problem is too much sediment, not too little. Today's Rio Grande, Rio Bravo is a much smaller river than it once was even in the middle of the 20th century. <clears throat> the prime culprit is the full utilization of water. The thickness of these bars is proportional to the mean annual flow for different periods of time. Today's Rio Grande that comes out of the San Juan Mountains of Colorado is for all intents and purposes disconnected from the river in the Big Bend by the full utilization of water in the San Luis Valley in central New Mexico and in the El Paso Juarez Valley uh, by both the United States and Mexico and also uh, in uh, southernmost New Mexico. Um, the amount of water utilized in the state of Chihuahua has steadily decreased as we've moved to full utilization of water in um, um, in the areas uh, in, in, in uh, the state of Chihuahua. What we've measured is that when the Rio Grande is wide, immediately after big hurricane floods, it immediately begins to accumulate sediment and narrow, and as it narrows, the quality of in-stream habitats degrades and is reduced. We know this because we've excavated long trenches. Um, and the irony of this trench near Castellon, Texas, is that from the bed to the top of the uh, here, which is about, um, well, more than uh, two meters, uh, well, th about three meters of fine sediment aggregation all of this occurred in a period of 15 years. The bed of this trench was a gravel bar in 1990. And we know this by dating the germination of tamarisk trees um, in this trench. The Rio Grande accumulates sediment. And it accumulates sediment because the river carries so much sediment during floods and then some of that sediment is deposited 
And the next time a moderate flood comes, the river goes out of its banks, and then it deposits a little bit more sediment, and the capacity of the channel is reduced, and the river gets even higher for the same moderate flood, and it keeps insidiously accumulating sediment. And the only time that that process is reversed is when the once in a decade hurricane floods just blow the place apart. And of course the problem here is that when this occurs there's devastation and harm to agricultural users and cities and people who live along the river. This is the flooding Rio Conchos. This is Oinaga. This is Presidio, Texas. And only when this harm to human settlements occurs is a river unraveling and reversing the uh, degradation of the natural aquatic system. Here's a photograph of the Rio Grande in Hot Springs Canyon in 1945. The river narrowed and then um, the river rewidened a bit after the 2008 her uh, tropical depression Lowell floods. We've developed time series. We understand the river only gets wide during these floods. We can't control when these occur, but we can hope to manage what goes on in the intervening periods. And so the rehabilitation goals and options for the river we can't control hurricanes, but we can try to limit and reduce the magnitude of channel narrowing that occurs between these periods because we think these episodes of channel narrowing are bad for the native ecosystem. We can only accomplish a small degree by controlling non-native vegetation, tamarisk and arundo donax. Fundamentally, the problem is a problem of water flows. And the problem here is that the water all comes out of Mexico whenever it does come out of the Rio Conchos and moves through the system, but the sediment comes in from the tributaries in the United States and Mexico, and we try to understand that. Obviously, this is a politically charged issue. We are... <coughs> You know, we have negotiated a minute on the Colorado River Delta to manage flows and sediment movement in the Delta. Here, we're just trying to understand the science of the river so that someday the United States and Mexico might have a conversation about flows and management of the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, in which we at least know what the science is of the system we then might de decide and talk about policy issues on. So we've implemented a sediment monitoring program here. Again, it's the same sort of system as in the Colorado River, but it is a problem where we have lots of sediment and the issue is too much sediment. Um, some of our measurements to date. When we have little flash floods in the system, we measure the attenuation of the water flow measured at a gauge at the upstream and downstream ends of Big Bend National Park. In this case, the floods came out of little flash floods up here the floods came through here and they all but disappeared by the time they got to the other end of Big Bend National Park. This is the flux of sand measured here at Castellon and then measured here at RGV at Rio Grande Village and this is the same for mud, silt and clay. And you can see that we measured a lot of transport of sand here and none here. What happened between the two? It all got deposited to narrow and degrade habitats between the two gauges. All of the sand got deposited here and most of the mud. In contrast, with significant releases out of 
uh, Louis Leone Dam, what we found was the mud, because its flood lasted so much longer, all of the mud that passed here went right on through. It did not contribute to habitat degradation in this reach, but a significant amount of the sand was deposited here. These are the interplays that we're trying to understand so we understand how habitats change with different sediment transport um, um, conditions in the river and the sources of water. What we've learned is that large flash floods do harm, degrade habitats, degrade the river by accumulating sediment. This is the mass balance on the, of the Rio Grande between the two gauges in Big Bend National Park. And long duration dam releases can reverse that but look at this, the magnitude of the change caused by this long dam release did not undo the total amount caused by one little flash flood. It's a very hard problem. I'm going to skip these last um, two slides um, and just focus in conclusion on uh, this sort of straw man proposed environmental flow for the Rio Grande based solely on the old traditional way of defining environmental flows based on statistical hydrologic models in which small fixed floods were proposed because um, the statistics of hydrology suggested that would be adequate for defining environmental flows. Unfortunately, what we've learned is those little spike flows do more harm than good. And the issue is the duration of flows and how much sediment they move. I apologize for moving fast, but my basic message is this. In the Southwest, we have to care about not only flowing water, but we have to care about how much sediment is transported. If we worry about how much sediment is transported, we can understand how to time flows in conditions of sediment deficit to do more good than harm. And in situations of sediment surplus, we'll have to decide when small flows that might otherwise seem like a good idea might actually do more harm to habitats than good. This is a message that says this is hard, this is complex, but we shouldn't be naive to the fact that we can solve and work on these problems if we put our minds to it. We certainly have the science to position ourselves to do it and to serve the data to, stake, to stakeholders so that they too can understand what this is all about. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jack, uh, for a really great presentation. You know, one of the things that the Desert LCC is really interested in is providing a forum where we can encourage the sharing of technology, methodologies, or lessons learned across our geography, so in this case from one river basin to another. Um, and I know that's um, a big part of what you, you all at Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center have done here um, with the technology you talked about. So that's really great. Um, so we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, Jack, can you see the um, participants list on the right-hand side of your screen? Uh, no, because I'm in slide mode. I'll have to get out of okay. slide no, mode. No, that's okay. You just stay there. And um, I'll okay. ask folks if you have a question. Um, I'm in the, the way we have this set up, I'm not able to see if you raise your hand. But I'll ask you to, um, to speak up. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself. And then um, we'll, we'll take questions as they come. So. Um, if you have a question, press star six and announce yourself. I 
I know there's questions out there. All right, so just in case the um, star well, six function. Uh, James has raised a hand, at least on my screen, it says that. Oh, so you can see that now, okay. Okay, so Bill can... Barsh has raised a hand. Okay, I see that. Okay, so, so Bill let's go Barsh with Bill. And James, one or the other. Sorry, okay, so let's go with James first. Go ahead and press star six and then um, speak up. Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hey, okay, Jack, great great job. Really appreciate this. Um, it was really interesting. Um, quick question. Um, I noticed, or <clears throat> unless I missed something, um, that your sampling was all on, and I realized what you're talking about, um, clays and silts and sands being <clears throat> the real um, focus of this. So you were sampling mostly suspended loads. And I was wondering if you guys, what you think about or if you're measuring at all um, bed load transport. Yeah, th thanks for that, Bill. So um, in Grand Canyon, um, uh, there has been ex uh, uh, extensive work um, done prior to define what is the proportion of the total flux that's bed load, sand and gravel, I'm sorry, sand moving as bed load. And we know that no the, the number is sort of 5%. And so um, um, uh, so um, we have measured it there. Um, what we know in any of these rivers where we um, have depleted flows is that the coarser stuff doesn't move. And so what happens is um, that the gravels don't move under depleted flow conditions, and the river profiles essentially develop stair steps where pods of gravel develop at the mouths of each tributary. So we are directly measuring, for instance, gravel accumulation at the mouths of tributaries throughout the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. And we know that the river uh, builds a stair-step profile, and the river only redistributes those uh, pods of gravel during hurricane floods. Um, so yes, you can't wing it. You do need to know whether bed load is important or not. And, on, and I think that one of the messages to everybody here is my talk has been largely about the rivers that have high suspended loads. And and we know that the percentage of bed load transport is small to trivial. But you can't guess that. You need to sort of know that. Does that help? Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. So I think Amy, you've had – I can see there's lots of hands that have gone up. Do you, I'm Jack, not sure do you how have you're, time? Do you have time to take a few more questions, Jack? I can, I can, sit, here, I can sit here. I can sit here forever. Okay, great. Well, I yeah. think Bill Bardish was up next. Bill, if you press star six, you'll unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Thank you, Amy. I, I really, I'm going to pass. I was more of a comment. I, I just wanted to also express the fact, uh, Jack, that this is uh, extremely valuable for uh, some of us on the, the eastern side of the landscape here to, uh, to get this information about the Rio Grande and, and, the, and the complex that uh, that uh, we see in the western states that uh, we don't hear as much about. But I, I just to quit that quick comment, and I'm going to pass because I know there's other folks with uh, uh, important questions. So, Jack, I'll let you call on folks that have their well, hands Well, actually, what, hap what happens on my computer is I only see their names come up once, and now they've disappeared. So. Somebody, okay. so I don't know who's waiting in line. <laughs> okay, um, I do have a question um, from Joe Sorotnik. Um, he sent me in a chat, and he wants to know if there is any evidence that the um, sources of sediment, either the quantity or quality, are different now than from the historic. Um, uh, we don't know that. 
but I in in making I'm going to go to ironically I'm going to show answer Joe's question uh, by showing this map of the Perea River watershed. Um, I think that this is a great and fundamental question for the entire um, desert region to ask, both in the United States and Mexico. If, um, if you ask a geologist, if you ask a guy like me, is the sediment loading and delivery from the Perea River changed significantly with time, I'm going to tell you it's always been that way. And um, that's implicit in a published graph like this, which shows the estimates by geologists of the sediment loads of different rivers in 1700. But if you ask an upland scientist with a focus on the effects of cattle grazing and land use, they will all tell you that the um, rates of sediment delivery are accelerated now from what they once were. And, um, and yet we have abundant evidence to know that these rivers have always carried very high sediment loads. And I think that it's a very productive um, um, uh, area of research to ask whether you could do a tremendous amount of upland restoration and significantly change the loading to the big rivers. My hunch is no, but I have other smart colleagues who would disagree with that. Certainly back in the 1930s, the Soil Conservation Service tried to build check dams all over the West to reduce sediment yield and accomplished relatively little. But I think that the basic answer is we're not sure whether we can significantly change the loading rates by large investments in upland restoration. I think that upland restoration needs to focus and be justified more based on its local effects to upland areas, but I recognize that others may disagree. Thanks, Jack. Um, do you see any hands raised on your screen? Um, I see a lot of people leaving the meeting, so uh, I'm seeing those. I, somebody who wants to raise their hand again should do so, because um, I can't see. Okay. Or, or just go ahead and uh, press star six and speak up. And, and if we get more than one at a time, we'll. we'll Kevin Urban Kevin Urbancic has raised a hand. Great. Hey Jack, I'm not sure. Am I can you hear we me can, now? Yes. You can? Yes. Amy? Okay. Um, you know we've got somewhere around 150 CMS right now and have for the last several days. Can you predict the impact? Is this a positive um, event as far as sediment transport for the Rio Grande and the Big Bend? Uh, how much? Um, it's somewhere, I mean, 150. Seeing, well, 200 CMS, according to IBWC, wow. below for CEO. Yeah, well. We're not seeing that at Castellon. It's a little less, but still. Right, right. So here's the, here's the deal, and I want to, I, I realize that there's many different levels of um, conversation here. Um, First off, Kevin, uh, hi, and it's uh, we haven't talked in ages. Um, um, uh, the, the message I, I want I want to to make sure that everybody gets a big take home point on the Rio Grande. The message is it depends on the duration of the floods. Um, a really big flight peak, um, like um, this one here, that went to 500 cubic meters per second, but only lasted a day or so, 
attenuates very quickly and all of the sediment that's transported uh, by this flood peak here gets deposited on the flood peak before it gets to the next downstream site. So the good news of what you're saying, Kevin, is that you seem to be saying it's a magnitude of 200 or 150 cubic meters per second, but it's occurring for many days. If it occurs for many days, then the river begins to run out of sediment supply and re-excavate the deposits that it has previously, you know, that it, it, it starts to re-excavate its deposits. And so long duration flows um, rejuvenate the channel. And so the issue is, is going to be Whatever you've got happening on the Rio Grande right now, it's how long do those flows occur. If they occur for a long enough time, it will do some good. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jack. Jack uh, there you go. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Hey, Jack, it's uh, Seth Shanahan. Just had a question for us. Um, and you have to forgive my ignorance about the Rio Grande because I, I really don't know anything about it. Is the primary uh, sediment dynamic concern related to ecological conditions, or are there other uh, resources at play in this uh, work that you're doing out there? Yeah, so um, I'm sure that some people on the phone might be holding their breath right now. Um, you know, I'm uh, obviously I, you know, I wear two hats. All of the work that it, all the geomorphology work on the Rio Grande that I did, I did as a college professor. I'll probably return to some of this work. And um, so, although GCMRC is involved down here in sediment measurements, um, nothing. I, I need to do this quick preamble just. There's no policy implications in anything I'm talking about here. Um, this is an issue, the Rio Grande, if you look at these two pictures, um, people who know the Rio Grande um, say, gee, that's a very different place. And, uh, it's, uh, um, and it's a national park. And the presidents of Mexico and the United States have signed joint declarations uh, declaring this place of uh, binational conservation interest. It is the biggest uh, conservation area that's shared between two nations in North America, uh, except for some shared parks in the Yukon Territory in Alaska. And so there is a mandate from the presidents of the United States and Mexico to try to do some environmental good. And so it is a landscape concern. And this Rio Grande, this little tiny Rio Grande River, is a river in which there now is an experimental population of the endangered Rio Grande silvery minnow. So there is an endangered fish concern here as well. All of that said, politically, the issues on the Rio Grande, I think the, the fair and honest way to say this is, it is a far less mature issue from an international policy, water policy issue. It is extremely controversial to talk about how Mexico would release water down to this shared river. And there has not been any formal negotiation. Um, there is no negotiation that such as what led to Minute 319. I have been into Mexico several times. Many people from the US agencies have been in to talk in a very exploratory way that is essentially would ask only one question. 
respecting fully the agreements in place about how water in the Rio Grande is to be shared, how could that water be managed to not change the amount of water, but to do the most good with the water that there is to share? In many ways, it's the same question as in the Delta. Not to change the international allocation, but simply to say, is there something we could do to do the most good with the water that's there? The Rio Grande is never going to go back to what it was in the early 20th century. But the question is, is there a way to do better than what there is now? And um, it's a policy issue that someday may emerge. It could be that the politics never change. But it's such a, di a, a difficult science issue that you've got to get the science right before you can even have the policy debate. Does that help? Thanks, Jack. Yeah, that's very helpful. Again, I, I know nothing about it, so this is all very helpful. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Jack. How are you doing on time? I'm fine. All right, we could maybe take a couple more questions. Yeah, you know, I should say, let me just say before other people uh, bail, uh, I'm sure that Amy has provided my contact information. Um, I understand this has gone very fast. Um, if there are questions of detail or substance that you'd like to have a conversation about, please shoot me an email. Um, I am by, I mean, I am a geomorphologist. These are my areas of expertise, but I have reflected the hard work of a whole bunch of people at GCMRC and graduate students of mine over the years and people I collaborate with at the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service and Bureau of Reclamation. And um, shoot me an email, I'll share with you my thoughts and I'll also put you in contact with other people who in many cases are far more expert than I. All right, are there any other questions? You can press star six to unmute yourself. All right, I'm gonna take that silence as a no. Um, Amy, it may only be you and I on the phone right now. Well, there's still a bunch of folks on the webinar. Um, you, you, you've kept them um, very engaged as an audience, I think, Jack. That was an excellent presentation. We really, really appreciate you making time to be with us today. So thank you very much for that. Um, folks, thank you also for making time to participate. Um, as I mentioned before the presentation, we have recorded this today, and it will be made available on our YouTube channel. You can search for Desert LCC YouTube, and it will pop right up. Um, will be available in about a week or so, most likely. So thanks very much, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.